Okay, welcome back. So in this section, we're going to be talking about data collection and focusing on one specific type of data collection, observational studies. So there are a lot of different ways that data can be collected. And some, some good, some bad. Um, and they all have their, their own pros and cons. So the most basic way that data is often collected is just through anecdotal evidence, word of mouth. Okay, so we'll expand on that in a little bit. We also have some more preferred methods, observational studies, and controlled experiments. Okay, so if I see some data, one of the first things I want to establish is how is this data collected? Right? Do I trust the method that has been implemented here? So the first common way that data it may be collected is anecdotal evidence. Right? That's kind of word of mouth or hearing from someone their, their own testimony about what happened. All right? that, that can be trustworthy in some cases, right? it, but it, it really only gives us a small window, not really a big picture view of what's going on. Right? So you know, an example of something like this, Jack saw on TV, you know, people saying, okay, well, there's this huge snowstorm. Global warming can't be real, right? Around when, when all this global warming talk was really, really uh, heating up. So people said, oh, there's this really big snowstorm. What well, can't be happening? All right. And I saw this on, saw this on the Daily Show. John Stewart must be a, a student of data collection here. Right? He says it's one storm in one place, right? So single instances, while interesting, right, just aren't always that useful for getting the big picture. Okay, what we really need to get the big picture is we need a baseline. We need we like large samples, right? I think that's that's pretty obvious, but we also need a baseline to compare things to. Right? That's where this idea of your treatment and control group comes in. Right. My treatment group will be the group of individuals that are in my study right, that are, are getting or have the characteristic that I'm interested in, whereas the control group right, is the, my baseline group that I'm comparing them to. So to really do a good job with something, we need to have this sort of setup in some way. Now, a lot of people think about treatment and control groups in with regards to just controlled experiments, right? But we can also have treatment and control groups in observational studies. So what is an observational study? Right? This is a type of situation where the researcher right, isn't affecting the situation, right? They're just observing and collecting data, right? So that means since the researcher isn't affecting the situation, the people, the individuals in the study, right, have to kind of sort themselves into groups. Right? Either, either by their own actions or just some sort of random process, but by someone who isn't involved in the situation. So when do we see observational studies implemented? Well, most of the time when we're doing any kind of studies with, with people, you know, especially with children, um, any, a lot of situations where we have some sort of you know, bad outcome study, a disease, addiction, right? We can't bring people in a lab and have them start smoking or something, right? We got to go out and observe people who are already smoking, okay? We also can study things that it's, it's maybe not ethical to bring them into a controlled environment and make them start doing, right? Now with observational studies, some other examples that you might see of these things can find some pretty interesting associations. One study that I saw said one of the conclusions they drew, or an association that they found anyways, was that the more TVs a person owns, the longer their life expectancy is. Hmm. Well, that doesn't really make sense on the surface, right? Maybe there's something else going on there. Another study or another kind of interesting graphic that I found was this. Again, relating things back to global warming. 
right? That's this study, now they did some kind of fancy work with the axes on this graph, but they're showing that as the number of pirates in the world went down, our temperature is going up. So maybe one of the causes of global warming, we need more pirates around. Okay, now obviously these are kind of silly examples, right? but these are examples of what are, what are called spurious correlations. Observational studies can be useful, and we can find interesting associations, right? but you can also find spurious correlations, and there's tons of funny ones out there. What is causing these spurious correlations? Maybe the presence of what's called a confounding, or also sometimes called a lurking variable. Right? This is something kind of going on in the background right? that we may not have accounted for. So from our previous example, where one of the associations found is more TVs led to a longer life expectancy. Right? Well, maybe there's something going on in the background, right? Maybe, maybe it's money, income level, right? The more money you have, the more TVs you buy, the more money you have, the better access to health care you probably have. Okay, so it's not necessarily that, yes, there was an association between these two things, right? But one isn't necessarily causing the other, right? There's this confounding variable going on in the background. All right, so all of these data collection methods have their pros and cons. Observational studies, yes, we can find interesting associations there. Right? And with observational studies, we can study pretty much anything we want, right? If it's something you're interested in, you can go out and find somebody who is doing that thing or has that characteristic, right? And you can study them. But there are definitely disadvantages, right? The association that we find, it may be bogus because of the the presence of this lurking variable, right? we can't necessarily isolate cause and effect to claim causality. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, that's where the next, the thing we're going to talk about in our next section comes in, controlled experiments, right? where we're trying to control for these factors. We use things such as randomization. Right? So we'll talk about this more in a future video. But right now we're focusing on observational studies. So let's hit on some important terminology when it comes to studies that you might see in the future. Right, one of the big things that you'll see are, are terms that have to do with time when you're looking at studies like this. Right, you may see what's called a retrospective study. Right, a study looking into the past where the data has already been collected. It's already readily available. Right, a retrospective study has the obvious pro of the data is already available. Right? You don't even have to do anything. So you save a lot of resources doing retrospective studies. Right? But the data may not be current or it may not be in the format that you want. On the other hand, a prospective study right, is a study that's been that where we're collecting data in the present. Okay, another time term is longitudinal data. Right? Longitudinal data is where I'm collecting data at regular increments over time for some purpose. Right? If you go to the doctor every year and they record your, your weight or your blood pressure, right? you can see how that's changing over time. That's longitudinal data. Right? We use these, these term, this terminology to define some different types of studies. Now, most of these types of studies this is terminology that you'll see lots of times in the medical field. Right? You might see something called a cross-sectional study. Right? A cross-sectional study is just a fancy word for a prospective survey. Right? It's just looking at a cross-section or a subset or a sample of that population at a given point in time. Case control study, right? this is where maybe, maybe you're studying something that's very rare. Right? You're trying to do a cross-sectional study with prospective data, and you went out, but you just couldn't find enough people that had the condition you were interested in. Right? Well, maybe you go back in time, you collect retrospective data on people that had that condition, right? and then compare them to a control group that does not have that condition. Okay, That's a, the idea of a case control study. And the last kind of study you see thrown around a lot is a cohort study. Right? A cohort study is where we've got a group of similar individuals and we want to follow them through time, producing longitudinal data. 
All right, so those are the basics of observational studies. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.